Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Burnt and Porter's webinar on How Will Tax Reform Affect You and Your Business? Thank you for joining us. Before we begin today's presentation, I would like to share a few items that will help ensure you get value, the most value, out of today's program. First, we're offering CPE for this class. To meet CPE requirements, you will have to answer eight of our 10 poll questions that will launch throughout the presentation. At the end of the webinar, additionally, a survey will launch on your screen. To earn CPE credit, you must complete this survey at the end of the program. Also wanted to let you know you can submit your questions at any time today using the question box in the webinar panel on your screen. We will address and respond to questions at the end of the presentation. And finally, in the handouts box of the webinar panel on your screen, you will find a PDF of today's presentation materials. Included in these materials are the slides we will be using to facilitate this presentation, as well as our white paper on the effects of tax reform. You can print or save these handouts for future reference. And now I'm pleased to present the first of today's speakers, Mr. Brendan McCullough. Brendan? Thanks, Amy. We're gonna to start today with a few of those poll questions to get to know the audience a little better. Please take a moment and answer the questions as they show up on your screen. While those questions are active, I wanna introduce everyone on the call today. I'm Brendan McAuliffe. We have Kayleen Bresnahan, Chris Julian, and Lee Ting Chong. This is a complex subject and we're gonna be deliberately brief in order to respect your time. If you have a specific question as we're going through the material this morning, please submit it and we'll do our best to address it. These polls are still going on, so why don't we talk a little bit about the process of tax reform, as the process generated almost as much interest as the actual contents of what's in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And the process is important as it impacted how the bill was drafted and how we're gonna be um, receiving needed corrections and guidance. And I make no mistake, this is the most significant tax reform in 31 years. In 1986, when we last had major tax reform, it was an iterative process that took 16 months to complete. This law took five and a half weeks from start to finish. Passing a bill this rapidly has taken its toll and there's many unintended consequences and a lot of uh, additional guidance and correction that's needed. Onto the process itself, on September 27th, the big six, big six, Steve Mnuchin, Gary Cohen, Mitch McConnell, Warren Hatch, Kevin Brady, and Paul Ryan released their unified framework for fixing our broken tax code. The framework had the stated goals of tax relief for middle class families, creating simple postcard tax filings for most Americans, tax relief for businesses, especially small business, ending incentives to ship jobs, capital, and tax revenue overseas, and closing special interest tax breaks and loopholes. President Trump had his own set of goals for tax reform, including a simple, fair, easy to understand tax code, giving American workers a pay raise by allowing them to keep more of their paychecks, making America a job magnet by leveling the playing field and bringing back trillions of dollars held offshore, and in an effort to stay politically neutral, I think the only fair way to judge this tax law is to see if it accomplished its stated goals. In that light, we're gonna launch another poll question here. About 70% of people have voted, a third say not confident, a third somewhat confident, about 10% are pretty confident, and another 20% are unsure. It's good to know. I think probably the most controversial part of the way this bill passed was it passed using a process called budget reconciliation. Budget reconciliation is a method to change existing tax laws in order to bring tax revenue in line with the budget. So Congress passed a new 10-year budget in October that allowed for $1.5 trillion worth of tax cuts. And all of the weirdness that you're gonna see in this new law 
is a result of trying to fit these tax cuts within this $1.5 trillion 10-year window. You're going to see certain provisions kick in later than others. Some expire early. Some things are temporary. Some things are permanent. All of this stuff is because the tax cuts had to stay under that $1.5 trillion number. Budget reconciliation also allowed the Republicans to pass the bill with a simple majority vote instead of the usual 60 votes needed in the Senate. At the time of passage, there were 52 Republican senators and 52 yes votes, meaning it passed without a single Democratic vote. The technical corrections that need to be issued uh, cannot pass via this budget reconciliation mechanism as they don't directly impact revenue. That means that 60 votes are needed in the Senate, and there's only 51 sitting Republican senators right now. So a minimum of nine Democratic senators are need to jump on board to pass the guidance and corrections that we need. And it's unclear whether they're going to want to play ball or not. However, we need guidance now. The first 2000 esti 2018 estimated tax payments are due in a couple months, and we don't want to pay the wrong amount. So what does this guidance look like? In our opinion, we're going to get some administrative notices pretty quickly here. This is IRS guidance that we can rely on without fear of incurring penalties until actual regulations are issued. And in the best case scenario, we get regulations in a temporary form this fall, and they go final in summer of 2019. That's a year and a half with no official guidance here, and you're going to see we really need that guidance. Now, the law itself evolved as it passed through Congress. The House bill had $850 billion of cuts going to corporations, $450 billion going to S-Corps and partnership owners, and $172 billion uh, going to reduce the estate tax. The mechanism used to achieve the uh, S-Corp and partnership tax savings was a rate reduction, reduction, which meant that the benefits accrued only to taxpayers in the top brackets. With the stated goal of middle-class tax reform, only $225 billion of the benefits were going to in to individuals and everything else was going to corporations and wealthy taxpayers. The public called this a bait and switch and a handout to the rich, um, and they weren't very happy with this first draft of the bill. The Senate heard that, uh, and their version of the bill made some changes, uh, fewer cuts going to corporations, more to S-Corps and partnerships, and more to individuals, and the mechanism um, that they used for S-Corps and partnerships was a deduction instead of a rate reduction, and this deduction means that it uh, applied to all business owners and not just um, top, ta top tax bracket payers. Uh, at this point, the House had the option to accept the Senate bill as drafted or enter into a conference to resolve the differences. They did the latter and the bill transformed again. The final version had $650 billion in tax cuts to corporations, $400 billion to pass-through owners, and $630 billion to individuals. The increase to individuals is a combination of a rate cut at the top and a big change to the child tax credit. Overall, I think they did a decent job of actually, in the final version, enacting middle class tax reform. Over 90% of individuals are going to see a tax break in year one, and the 10% that aren't going to see a tax break are higher income taxpayers in high tax states like California, New York, and New Jersey. So we're going to launch into one more poll here. These are going to slow down, believe me, as we uh, continue through the day, and then we're going to dive into the meat of the new law. New tax legislation will impact individuals, businesses, international operations, trusts, and estates. Which element of this legislation is most important to you? Pretty strong responses for businesses and individuals. International seems to be uh, lagging in the end, and the estate tax changes are, are important to a number of the people as well. So here's Kayleen. She's going to talk about a lot of the changes to the individuals. So first I want to start by saying it's important to note that a lot of the individual change changes the estate tax changes and the changes at the in individual level to the alternative minimum tax will expire on December 31st, 2025. So none of these are really permanent. However, the corporate tax rate reduction is permanent. 
So first, let's talk a little bit about the estate taxes that are going down, as Brendan mentioned. Um, this is being done by an increase to the exemption amount. The exemption amount was essentially doubled from $5.6 million for an individual in 2017 to $11.2 million for an individual in 2018. This means that a couple can use portability of their exemptions to exclude $22.4 million of assets from the estate tax. However, we live in Washington, so it's important to remember that the Washington exemption amount is much lower at approximately $2.1 million, and the rates are a little bit higher than in other states. Let's jump to another polling question. Does the increase in estate tax exemption make you more likely, less likely, or make no difference in whether you will seek out estate planning advice? Interesting, Les jumped out to the lead, but now it's all the way down in last place. 70% no difference, 25% more likely. All right. Now let's start talking about the individual rate changes. So this, this first slide shows the single individual income tax rates. Uh, as you can see, the top rate has decreased from the 39.6, which it previously was, to 37%. Um, the bracket also starts at a later amount of taxable income. It previously started at 418000 of taxable income. Now it starts at taxable income over 500000 Next, let's look at the married filing jointly tax brackets. Uh, the top rate is still at 37% that it was for single individuals, but the top bracket doesn't kick in until 600000 of taxable income. Prior to the changes, it was only $467,000 of taxable income when the top rate of 39.6 kicked in. We also included the head of household tax rates and the married filing separate tax rates for your reference. Next, there were some major changes to the standard deductions and exemptions. The standard deductions essentially doubled. So if you were married, they are now $24,000. Previously, it was approximately $12,000. If you're single, the standard deduction increased to $12,000 and it was previously approximately $6,000. This change alone will reduce the total number of individuals that need to itemize and therefore have a more complex tax return. Another major change is personal exemptions were eliminated. These, were, these previously were claimed if you had any dependents and you would get one for every dependent you had. The good news is Congress did enact an enhanced child tax credit to help offset the changes related to the exemptions. The child tax credit was greatly enhanced, so it increased from $1,000 per kid to $2,000 per kid. But more importantly is that the income phase-outs have increased. Previously, you didn't get this credit if you were single and making over $55,000 or married and making over $110,000. Now you can make up to $200,000 as an individual and $400,000 as a married couple and still get the tax credit. So this helps make up for a little bit of the exemptions being eliminated. Um, and I know it seems like these, these tax rates when, or the bracket when these phase out is low, but previously the exemptions were phased out at this level anyways. So the people that aren't getting this weren't getting the exemption and the trade-off is really putting them about in the same spot. Next, let's talk about the deductions for AGI, adjusted gross income. Uh, repeals were made here. Alimony payments are no longer deducted from the adjusted gross income of the payor. So if you are going to get divorced and you'll be paying alimony, you should probably finalize your divorce before the end of 2018 if you want to deduct it. Um, if you're going to be receiving alimony, you should probably be nice until 2018 because, or 2019 because after that, it will no longer be picked up in your income. Moving expenses related to the relocation for a job are no longer a tax deduction. And the Congress also eliminated the Section 199 deduction, which is the Domestic Production Activities deduction, allowing you to deduct 9% of income for qualified production income. Um, hopefully, this is mostly being offset by the 199A deduction that Chris is going to talk about in a little bit. 
Itemized deductions had some major changes as well. Previously, itemized deductions got phased out once you reached the top brackets. This created an effective tax rate increase of about 1.2% for those in the top bracket. So this phase out was completely eliminated, eliminated, and this is a good thing for a lot of taxpayers. However, on the other side, there are some limitations on the itemized deductions and some deductions that you're no longer going to be allowed to take. For example, mortgage interest is being limited even more. Um, previously, you could deduct interest related to $1 million of acquisition debt, and you could also deduct interest related to $100,000 of home equity interest. For loans entered into after December 15, 2017, only mortgage interest related to $750,000 of debt is deductible as mortgage interest. Interest in expense related to home equity debt is not deductible unless qualified as another form of deductible interest after this date as well. There were also some major changes to the deductibility of state and local taxes. This is probably the one I heard about the most in the news. You heard about a lot of people running to their local assessor's office to prepay their property tax because in 2018, they're going to be limited. For 2018 and going forward, you can only deduct a total of $10,000 in taxes as an itemized deduction. This includes real estate taxes, state and local income taxes, personal property taxes, and sales taxes. So this is largely going to affect individuals in New York, California, and New Jersey, where the individual income tax rate is fairly high. It's important to note that real estate taxes related to a business or investment property or a rental property are not limited, and those are still deductible. This $10,000 is also one of the only thresholds that isn't index for inflation, so it won't go up. It's always going to be $10,000. Some miscellaneous itemized deductions were eliminated and no longer are deductible. The largest impact is likely unreimbursed employee expenses. Uh, you can also no longer deduct tax prep fees and investment advisory expenses. These could be large numbers for some of our clients, so this is important to know. Um, casualty losses are also no longer deductible if they are not in a federally declared disaster area. Medical expenses are going to be limited to a greater adjusted gross income floor in 2019 through 2025. They'll be limited to 10% of adjusted gross income. There were some other changes related to charitable deductions. This one is actually a good one. You previously could only deduct up to 50% of adjusted gross income. Now you can deduct up to 60% of adjusted gross income. However, there is another change to charitable deductions that's not good. Uh, previously, if you paid money for sporting tickets to a university, you could deduct 80% of the purchase price because it was considered the right to purchase the tickets and a tax deduction. The Congress has decided that you can no longer deduct this amount, and I think this will impact a lot of our clients here in Washington. Let's jump to the next poll. Based on these tax changes for individuals, how confident are you that you'll see a reduction in your personal taxes? Not at all confident, somewhat confident, very confident, or unsure? Right, overall, it looks like most people are somewhat confident or very confident, with 21% of you not at all confident that this is going to help you. <clears throat> well, hopefully we can find a way to make it help everyone. Um, next, there were a few other revealed provisions that are important to talk about. Um, the first is entertainment expenses are no longer deductible from 2018 going forward. This means Seahawks tickets, golfing, those types of Expenses cannot be deducted for tax purposes. Meals provided for the convenience of an employer previously were 100% deductible, but now they are being limited to only 50% deductible for tax purposes. If the law remains unchanged, these will be 100% non-deductible after 2025. The expense for providing qualified transportation fringes are no longer deductible to the employer. And then another change is technical terminations of partnerships are eliminated. This is a good thing, and probably only really tax accountants will appreciate this, but we no longer have to file multiple returns in the year of a ownership change greater 50% or greater. There were some other major changes to the tax code, and the first is related to um, 
method changes. The method changes that we're going to talk about now are only related to taxpayers with less than $25 million in average gross receipts over the last three years. Taxpayers can now be on the cash method even if the entity is a C-corporation or a partnership with a C-corporation owner. Taxpayers can be on the cash method even if the business has inventory. Taxpayers can avoid capitalization of overhead costs to inventory under Internal Revenue Code 263A. Now, I know that's a tax jargon, but basically it's a tax calculation that isn't generally beneficial to taxpayers and it's a pain for tax preparers to calculate. So this is a good thing. Contractors can use the com completed contract method instead of the percentage of completion to account for longer term contracts. These will all be automatic changes that can be made by filing an accounting change request with the 2018 income tax return. There were some major changes to like-kind exchanges, otherwise known as 1031 exchanges. You previously could do a 1031 exchange, which is essentially a gain deferral on the exchange of property as long as it fell within the IRS prescribed timeframes and guidelines. Prior to the law change, you could do an exchange with land, buildings, vehicles, or equipment. Now you can only do this related to land or building exchanges. If the exchange was in process by the end of 2017, you can still finish up that exchange and it, the deferred gain will still apply. Going forward in 2018, no longer can you do like kind exchanges on equipment and vehicles. There were some major changes to the individual alternative minimum tax. The alternative minimum tax will apply to less individuals because the exemption amounts are higher and get phased out at higher amounts of taxable income. Most of the adjustments for AMT are gone as well. Exemptions, state and local taxes, and other miscellaneous adjustments are, are generally the ones that would kick individuals into alternative minimum tax, and most of those are no longer going to be deductible anyway. One more thing that, the, or that Congress put into this law is a hidden revenue ranger, raiser. The way inflation was indexed changed from CPI indexes to chain CPI. This means that there will be slower increases to tax brackets and phase-outs for inflation each year. Next, I'm going to hand this over to Chris Julian, and he's going to talk about the Section 199A pass-through deduction. Hello, I'm Chris Julian, and I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the most exciting yet amb ambiguous part of this new tax law, and that's the Section 199A 20% pass-through deduction. Um, <clears throat> On its face, it's a maximum deduction of 20% of the income generated by sole proprietorships, most rentals, partnerships, S corporations, and estates and trusts. This deduction is not available for specified service businesses that are under certain income thresholds. We'll talk about both those things very soon. This will not reduce your self-employment taxes. It will not uh, cause any adjustments to the alternative minimum tax, which is a good thing. And taxpayers that invest in real estate investment trusts and publicly traded partnerships, the ordinary income from those should also receive this 20% deduction. So um, unless the business is excluded under the specified service business definition that we'll talk about soon, all trades or business should qualify for this deduction. Uh, these are just some examples below of some common industries that we serve here at BP, but the list is much longer than this. So it's very important to know, we're going to talk about three big limitations with this deduction, the service limitation, a W-2 limitation, and a capital asset limitation. It's very important that if your income, your taxable income for a married couple is $315,000 or less, or for all other taxpayers, $157,500 or less, that you don't have to worry about any of these limitations. Um, the, and these limitations will be phased in over the next 100,000 of income for married couples and 50,000 for all other taxpayers. So what is qualified business income? And in general, it's gonna be income that's taxed at ordinary rates from these, these types of businesses, sole proprietorships, rentals, S-corps, partnerships, estates and trusts. It's not gonna include investment income like interest and dividends, capital gains, and it won't include income that's not uh, connected with a United States trader business. So foreign income isn't going to qualify for this deduction. Now let's talk about the actual deduction. So it's, it starts 
with a base of 20% of your qualified business income. But there's, like we, like I said, there's a wage limit and then there's a, a capital asset limit. Uh, so you compare the greater of 50% of the W-2 wages paid by the business or 25% of the W-2 wages paid plus 2.5% of the original cost of the depreciable property that you own. This second bullet point was kind of a last minute addition that, um, that, that will do a lot for, uh, especially for commercial landlords that typically don't pay a lot of W-2 wages, but own a lot of depreciable property. Absent that rule, um, most landlords wouldn't be eligible for much, if any, deduction at all. So let's talk about what's included in this 2.5% of cost of depreciable property. Um, it doesn't include every asset on your depreciation schedule, but it will include those amounts that are uh, for personal property, typically speaking, it's gonna be included for, for 10 years from the date that you acquire it. And it can also, if your depreciable life under the IRS rules is longer than 10 years, you can keep it on the schedule for that long. So uh, with that, think about real property, which has, li has lives between 15 and 39 years. So you're gonna get your asset for a minimum of 10 years and possibly up to 39 for commercial real estate. Uh, it will not include land, which is not depreciable, and it must be something that's owned and placed in service before the end of the year. <clears throat> this deduction is going to be limited by taxable income over capital gain. And um, the easiest way to explain that, I think, is to go through this, this brief example here. So you have a married taxpayer with 100000 of qualified business income, 100000 of long-term capital gain, and $30,000 of itemized deduction. The total taxable income here is $170,000. You would first calculate a tentative deduction based on the qualified business income there of $100,000, which would give you a tentative deduction of $20,000. However, that's gonna be limited because when you, when you factor this in, you, you have $170,000 of taxable income less $100,000 of net capital gain. So that leaves you with $70,000 of ordinary income left in this tax in, in your computation of taxable income. So your 199A is going to be 20% of that 70,000. So the deduction is now reduced to 14,000. The the point of this is that this deduction is intended to offset ordinary income, not offset capital gain. Uh, this is just a table of the effect of what 199A does to your tax rate. Um, if your business fully qualifies and you get the full 20% deduction. And what this shows is that, you know, your business income is going to be taxed at some of the lowest rates in history. So we'll talk about the third limit and probably the most, uh, most controversial limit, and that's the specified service business. Um, the, the new code section references a different code section that lists a long, has a long list of businesses here that are ineligible, but it, then there's this catch-all at the end uh, that's especially troubling that says, any trader business where the principal asset of such trader business is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. That's gonna be very difficult to interpret, and um, we're definitely looking forward to guidance on that because the difference between getting this deduction and not getting this deduction is extremely significant, especially considering estimated payments are due in a couple months. Um, 199A did do a, a big favor for architects and engineers. Um, it, it, absent uh, them being pulled out of this definition, not only would they have lost the, the former 199 deduction for domestic production activities, then they wouldn't have gotten this as well, kind of a double whammy on those two industries, but they were saved. Architects and engineers will qualify for this deduction. Uh, 199A did also add some other investment businesses um, to the definition of a specified service business. You know, definitely see some problems with this catch-all at the end about uh, the skill or reputation of employees or owners. Uh, just an example here, um, you know, a taxpayer that constructs uh, custom woodworking. It's clearly not a service business. This is a business that's selling a product. However, um, are people buying it because of the product or are they buying it because of the skill or reputation of the owner of the business? It's going to be very difficult to interpret this. I, I, I'm looking forward to guidance. 
Another issue with this 199A deduction that uh, creates some ambiguity is that the you know a strict interpretation of the law doesn't treat all business owners and entity types equally. Um, so we're going to go through a fact pattern where a husband and wife own a business. The wife is the key officer of the business, and H is merely a co-owner. Um, business builds and sells a product. Uh, business has no employees. They use independent contractors, and the business has no substantial fixed assets. Um, so we'll go through the various entity types of this structure, um, and we're going to assume that this business generates a half a million dollars of income in 2018. So a husband and wife owned entity uh, could be taxed on a Schedule C um, uh, as a sole proprietorship. So we'll start there. So that half a million dollars of income, uh, you're going to first multiply that by 20% to, to get your tentative deduction. That tentative deduction would be $100,000. But um, we're over the income ceiling. So uh, the W-2 limits or the limitations that we have, we have to go look through those, and there are no W-2 wages paid in this business. Sole proprietorships can't pay wages to their owners, and therefore there is no deduction because the 52% of W-2 wages is zero. Same scenario, now, but now we're in an S-corp where S-corporations require reasonable compensation be paid to, to their owners. So uh, determining reasonable compensation was already a big subject. Now it's, uh, it's even bigger. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the wife will pay herself $125,000 in wages, and this is going to reduce that flow-through income of $500,000 down to $375,000. Uh, so we first, we have flow-through income of three seventy-five, dollars and you're going to multiply that by 20% for the tentative deduction of $75,000. That's going to be limited to, to 50% of the W-2 wages. Well, now we have W-2 wages because the S-Corp is required to pay wages to the owner. 50% um, of those wages is gonna be $62,500. So that's gonna be our deduction here. Now we go into a partnership example where it's gonna be, we're, we're gonna do similar to the S-Corp where W uh, pays a, a guaranteed payment of $125,000. Partners and partnerships aren't eligible to be paid wages. So they have, if they're getting paid for services, it's, uh, it's in a guaranteed payment. And guaranteed payments are not included in qualified business income, QBI. Um, so we're gonna, like the S-Corp, the flow through income on this is, is where our tentative deduction is gonna be calculated. 20% of 375 is 75,000. But like the sole proprietorship, we have no W-2 wages. So there, there is no deduction eligible for this, this entity. Uh, this summary table here uh, just goes through those three, those three alternatives and kind of uh, you know, shows that in a setting like this, the S corporation is clearly the entity of choice. However, that's not gonna be consistent because if we look at the same fact pattern, but now let's just, let's knock down the income to 200,000. So now these businesses are under the income threshold. So the limit, the W-2 limitations, we don't ha and we don't have to look at those anymore. So in a sole proprietorship now, that $200,000 of income is going to generate a tentative deduction of 40,000, 20% of 200,000, and because the taxable income is below 315, we don't have W-2 limitations to worry about, so they're going to get a full deduction of $40,000. Now we're, we're, we're in the S-Corp, An s corps going to still require reasonable compensation. Um, maybe we can justify a lower salary because we have lower income now, um, but uh, you still need to pay yourself. And, and if this is a sole owned business where you know, the, the owner is doing almost everything, you, you would have to pay at least enough to, to replace yourself. So let's pay $80,000, reducing flow through income from 200 to 120. Um, now the uh, the 20% deduction is going to be based off of the flow through of 120, uh, getting you to a deduction of 24,000 in this case. Partnerships, uh, they you know they don't require guaranteed payments for services, and in a scenario like this where the income's lower, well, we wouldn't recommend that guaranteed payments be paid, um, and the, therefore you're going to have um, 200,000 of flow through income, and it's going to mirror the sole proprietorship where you get a $40,000 deduction on that income 
and the way because the W-2 limitations don't apply. Um, and here's just a summary of of those three. Um, so it's the bottom line is that there isn't a, a single answer to any one taxpayer. Your situation is going to have to be carefully analyzed based on your facts and circumstances. Um, <clears throat> 199A is going to result in the netting of income and losses with multiple trades or businesses. So if you have a business with with income and then a business with loss, those are going to get netted together to, to generate your total 199A deduction. So simply put, if you have one business with 400000 of net income and another business with 300000 of net loss, the maximum deduction you can expect is going to be $20,000 or 20% of the residual 100000 of income. There are loss carryovers to deal with as well. Um, if, um, if, if you have a loss in one year and generate a zero 199A deduction, that, that loss is gonna carry forward to your subsequent year's return to offset future 199A income to the, reduce that deduction. Um, it's, that's kind of confusing, so we put this example here. Um, so in 2018, taxpayer is out has business one business with 20,000 of income and another business with $50,000 of loss. Uh, this taxpayer wouldn't get any 199A deduction in this setting, uh, but they would they would take a $30,000 loss on their tax return, um, and then but that $30,000 loss is going to carry over in the background to 2019 uh, for the purposes of 199A deduction. So now 2019 comes around, those same two businesses um, generate a total of 70,000 of income combined. Um, the, uh, that $30,000 loss from 2018 is gonna offset the 70,000 for purposes of calculating the 199A deduction. So we're gonna have $40,000 of 199A income times 20% to generate an $8,000 deduction. I think the purpose of this is so that your cumulative earnings throughout this 199A period will never generate more than a 20% deduction on your cumulative income. So there's definitely, there's a lot of talk about the specified service business designation and what to do about it. Um, businesses are talking about packing, meaning um, inserting qualified businesses into disqualified businesses. Uh, an example, you know, a law firm, which is clearly a specified service business, maybe by acquiring a commercial building, they get into the rental business or an, a famous actress who is that, that's a clear, clearly a specified service, launches a skincare line. Is this gonna work? Um, I don't think so. Um, 1202, which is referenced in the specified service definition requires that uh, a disqualified business only be involved in the performance of services. And with 199A being determined on a business by business basis, it's very likely the IRS would carve this out. Um, it's clear that regulations and guidance is needed in this area. Another option is cracking. So breaking up a qualified business from a disqualified business. Um, an example uh, would be a group of doctors forms an entity to, to handle all the human resources and administrative functions. Is that new business in, in the field of health? Uh, you know, on its surface, no, it wouldn't be, but there are regulations out there that, that have pulled those types of businesses back in, um, and it, it's definitely a concern that uh, regulations under 199A are going to kill this idea, it, and if, if that happens, I mean, it would it could be very costly to and administratively burdensome to crack up your business only to find out that that achieved no tax savings. There is a uh, there. There are some issues with the W-2 wage limitation that I feel are going to affect a lot of our clients. Um, a lot of a lot of taxpayers um, use professional employer organizations to deal with their payroll, and they're the ones issuing the W-2s. Um, there are common paymasters where you have multiple project entities, but you want to have one entity deal with the payroll because it it, it is. A, a big administrative challenge to have each company run their own payroll when you can just have one do it. Um, and regulations are going to dictate how these W-2 wages are allocated amongst the business. It's not going to be as simple as just if you know if you if you paid the wages, you're going to get those wages because um, that could and if that was the case, that could severely limit the deduction in some cases. 
And then shareholder compensation. This is definitely going to be an issue. Uh, if you, as you saw in these previous examples, if you've got higher income and you're and you have to apply the wage limitations, the S corporation has, has some advantages in that they have they have to pay their owners' wages, where partnerships and S corporations are prevented from paying their owners' wages. So I'll uh, open up a poll question on this, and based on this discussion of 199A and this pass-through deduction, uh, how well has this legislation achieved its goal of making the tax code simple, fair, and easy to understand? I look forward to these responses. Um, it's, uh, so is it clear as mud? Is it no worse than it was, or is this a piece of cake? I think one thing to point out is that um, if anybody is out there advising you that you have to do something right now related to this, or you should have done it yesterday. It's not that we don't know the answers to these questions. It's, it's that nobody knows the answers to these questions. So just be aware of anybody trying to push something on you right now, because absent guidance, it, it's unclear to anybody how best to proceed. I'm going to turn. Okay. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it looks like, uh, um, that's the answer I would have expected. Um, I did my best, but yeah, this is definitely clear as mud. Um, so I, we're going to turn it over to Kayleen. Uh, she's going to talk about the new interest limitation. And uh, thank you for your time. One other thing Congress enacted is a new interest deduction limitation. This will apply to taxpayers with revenue greater than $25 million based on their three-year average. The net interest expense will only be deductible to the extent of 30% of adjusted taxable income. And you will not have to include your interest expense in this limitation. Interest that is disallowed in the current tax year will be carried forward until used. You don't completely lose it. You just don't get to use it in the current tax year. This limitation does not include motor vehicle dealerships, car dealerships that have floor plan financing, which is very spendy and high on the interest side. Uh, the next slide shows what, what adjusted taxable income means for this limitation. It's a little different than normal adjusted taxable income. So, um, oh, I did split. All right, sorry about that. Uh, adjusted taxable income is taxable income before any non trader business income, deduction, gain, or loss, any business interest, expense, or income, any net operating loss any depreciation, amortization, or de depletion, and the Section 199A deduction Chris just went over. So it's a, it's a form of EBITDA. Um, let's go through a quick example to show how this is calculated and limited. For 2018, Corporation X has $100,000 of adjusted taxable income. And we're gonna assume that this taxpayer has averaged revenue greater than the $25 million limitation. They also have $2,000 of business interest income and $12,000 of business interest expense. The interest expense is going to be 100% deductible because of this. $100,000 times the 30% limitation equals a 30% or $30,000 limit for interest expense. We get to add to that our interest income of $2,000, so there's a total interest expense that is allowable of $32,000. This taxpayer only has $12,000 of interest expense and it's fully deductible. So this will apply to all entities, including flow through entities, but for flow throughs, it will need to apply at the entity level and then again at the individual level. The individual level makes, must make sure that they're taking 30% of their income into consideration without including their share of the business income. This means you can't double count that invest or that business income in this limitation. Some taxpayers can get out of this limitation and these taxpayers are electing real property trades or business. There's a list of these types of businesses as pretty much anyone in a business related to real property. Um, and we also think it'll apply to hotels. Uh, the trade-off for electing to not have this limitation apply is that you have to use the alternative depreciation system. Now, the downfall to this is the alternative depreciation system doesn't allow you to take bonus depreciation it takes depreciation at slower rates and it creates longer depreciable life. So each individual business will need to analyze if it makes sense to elect out if, if they can, if they're a real property trader business or if they should use the limitation and not elect out. Um, 
Let's do one quick poll on this. Thinking about your business, do you believe your interest deduction will be limited? Yes, no, or it's not applicable. So it looks like for the most part, it'll be not applicable or it won't affect the business. About 18% of our business owners out there will be affected by this. Okay, now I'm going to turn it back over to Brennan. He's going to talk about excess losses and C corporations. Thanks, Kayleen. Everything we've talked about so far has been, um, it's been a tax cut. Now we're going to talk about a couple of revenue raisers related to loss limitations. Under the old law, if you were materially participating in a business, this is other than corporation, so partnership, rental, um, S corporation, if you materially participated and that business generated a loss, that loss could offset other income uh, without limitation. Under the new rules, your net business losses are limited to uh, zero plus a gimme of 500,000 for married couples and 250,000 for single uh, individuals. If you have a loss in excess of this amount, it's carried over as a net operating loss. And as we're gonna see uh, in, in a little bit here, net operating losses get a, a new treatment and it's not as favorable. So quick example on this, Joe sells his business for $50 million, he invests uh, the net proceeds, and he generates a million dollars of investment income in 2018. He gets bored. He wants to start a new business. He says, oh, I know how to lose a lot of money. I'm going to open a winery. So he puts money in, and he uh, generates a loss of $800,000 in 2018 from that business. Under the old rules, his million dollars of investment income could have fully been offset by that $800,000 loss. Now he has no other business income, so under the new rules, his loss is limited to zero plus that 500,000, we're assuming that he's married. So the million dollars of investment income is offset by the $500,000 limit, and he's paying tax on 500,000 instead of 200,000 under the old rules. That $300,000 excess is carried forward as a net operating loss, and net operating losses have less favorable treatment under the new laws than they did under the old law. We're gonna start with the old law because if you have any existing uh, NOLs, net operating losses, those are still treated under the old law. And under the old law, those losses could be carried back two years after the year that they were incurred in to recoup some taxes that you paid in earlier years, and then they were carried forward for 20 years. And in that carry forward period, they could offset income, um, all of your income up to 100%. Under the new law, net operating losses generated for tax years beginning after 1 1 2018, beginning 1 1 2018 and after, can't be carried back. And they can only offset 80% of income in future years. So Hypothetical situation here, business loses a million dollars in year one, makes a million dollars in year two. It's a net of zero over those two years. Under the old law, million dollar loss carries forward, fully offsets the million dollars of income in the subsequent year, no taxes paid. New law, lose a million dollars, carry it forward. You can only offset to the extent of 80% of taxable income in those future years. So even though the business has made no money between the two years, it's net of zero, they're still paying tax on $200,000. And these NOL carryback rules are what helped a lot of businesses get through the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Generated big losses, carried it back, got some tax refunds that floated the business until the economy turned around. We can't do that anymore. So if there's a downturn in the economy while these rules are active, it's going to dramatically impact um, 
a lot of taxpayers. So in addition to the 199A deduction Chris talked about, I think that the corporate tax rate got a lot of the headlines from this tax return. Uh, under the old law, it had a top rate of 35%, and it worked its way through a number of brackets to get up to that number. Under the new law, flat 21%, um, dollar one, paying 21% tax on that, and it applies to C corporations, including personal service corporations, which used to be taxed at a flat rate of 35%. If you happen to have a fiscal year end corporation, on the year that straddles the beginning of 2018, you're going to have to do a uh, prorated calculation using the old and new rates. Another big win for corporations was the elimination of the corporate alternative minimum tax especially for big businesses making more than $50 million or having more than $50 million in uh, annual sales, their credit for research and development or work opportunity tax credits, a couple of the big ones, used to be limited by the corporate uh, alternative minimum tax. That's no longer the case, and it's going to be a big, uh, big break to corporations. And it's worth pointing out this corporate uh, AMT elimination is – permanent, and the rate reduction, permanent, which is different than how um, individuals are being treated under this law. So are we entering the golden era of C corporations? The answer used to be no. Now the answer is it depends. Under the old rules, there was about a 10-point spread between being a C corporation and an S corporation. Once you factored in, you know, the corporate pays tax on their earnings and they pay tax again when the money is distributed out to the shareholders, S corporations only pay one level of tax. Um, under the new law, that 10 point spread is still there if the corporation um, qualifies fully for the 199A deduction. If you don't qualify for that 199A deduction, there's a three point rate spread still in favor of the S corporations. That assumes that you're in uh, a state like Washington where there's no state level corporate income tax. It gets a little bit murkier if you have high uh, state income taxes paid by the business owners for an S corporation. Since those taxes are no longer deductible to the extent that they exceed $10,000, if you got a lot of California or um, you know, other states where there's high income tax on business income, it, it's less clear. And so that's why you got to do a, a careful analysis of, uh, of your specific situation. And something else that factors into C corporations uh, is, is something called 1202, which is a code section that allows you to exclude gain on the sale of eligible stock. To be a Section 1202 stock and then eligible for this gain, it has to be C Corporation stock. The company has to have assets less than $50 million when you acquire the stock. It can't be one of those specified service businesses that we talked about earlier, and this does include um, engineers and architects, so they can't be uh, 1202 businesses. You have to get the stock directly from the company at its original issuance. You can't buy it from a an existing shareholder, and you have to hold it for five years. If you meet all these requirements, you can exclude up to $10 million of gain or 10 times your adjusted basis, the greater of those two numbers, when you sell the stock. Now, this provision has been around since 1993, and it's not been, uh, it hasn't been useful. The gain exclusion was 50%, and then the the remaining gain was taxed at 28%, and then there was some AMT adjustments that kicked in. So it didn't yield the benefit, even though it's been in the code for uh, you know 25 years. They changed it in 2010 to this 100% exclusion. So 2010, it becomes useful. Five years from that, 2015, you have the first people that are selling uh, this stock. Those tax returns are filed in 16. Audits start in 17. We might start to see some some court and audit guidance on, on this because the definition of specified service business is really important here as well. So the old answer of how do I set up my business in a, in a tax efficient manner, C-Corps were, were always out. Now, from a tax perspective, 
that's not necessarily the case. You know, take take a look at the the old uh, regime where you had a high corporate tax rate, you had a dividend rate of 15%, and that 1202 didn't didn't yield you any benefit. Uh, if someone invests $500,000 into a business, it's going to earn $200,000 annually, distribute half the earnings as a dividend every year, and then exit the business in five years in a $3 million transaction. Over the life of the business, you're going to pay $765,000. That's the old law. The new law, lower corporate rates, higher dividend rates, but this gain exclusion, you pay less than half of the tax that you would um, under the old law. So it may make sense to be a C corporation now. We don't, we, there's no one size fits all answer. So you gotta, you gotta look at your, um, your specific business. Positive changes to the tax code for all businesses uh, relate to depreciation. Old categories of depreciable property called qualified leasehold improvement property, qualified retail improvement, and qualified restaurant improvement property are all gone and they've been replaced by a new category called qualified improvement property. It's a broader category. Uh, it encompasses a lot more things and it's designed to have a 15 year tax life. Now, one of the things that we see, one of the oddities from pushing this bill through so fast is that there's cross references related to this specific section that go nowhere. So there's, it's never given a 15 year tax life. And so it reverts to a 39 year tax life unless one of those technical corrections we've talked about is passed. Assuming that it's passed, it has a 15 year tax life and this qualified improvement property is any improvement that's not structural to the interior portion of a building. And unlike the, the prior requirements for qualified leasehold improvement properties, certain, certain restrictions have been lifted. But what this means, because we now have 100% bonus depreciation, is taxpayers can write off tenant improvements to the interior portions of buildings in year one, instead of depreciating those over 15 or 39 year tax lives. So bonus depreciation used to be 50% and it was going to phase down and go away. It got bumped up from 50% to 100%, meaning you can write off the cost, the full cost of uh, pretty much anything besides a building or land that we put in service over the next five years. Uh, starting in 2023, there's a 20% phase down over five years. And again, this phase down uh, takes place over time. You know, it's got, a, it's got a limited life, and this all has to do with fitting into that $1.5 trillion box. Uh, bonus depreciation applies to, like I said, almost anything but uh, building or land. And uh, you get a little kicker for uh, luxury autos. A lot of the depreciation on automobiles used for business purposes is limited. Those, those amounts went up a little bit. little nuance. If you buy an SUV that weighs more than 6,000 pounds, the luxury uh, auto limitations don't apply. And with bonus depreciation, you have the ability to write off the full cost of that uh, in year one. So be a good American, buy a big SUV, and you'll get some tax benefits from it. Uh, Section 179 is another asset expensing provision. Uh, bonus depreciation can take you down to negative infinity. Section 179 is limited to income. This amount, uh, the amount that you can write off under Section 179 is increased to a million dollars. If you acquire more than $2.5 million in qualified assets, you start to lose the benefit of Section 179 on a dollar for dollar basis. Uh, that qualified improvement property is eligible for Section 179. And the big change is that uh, landlords can now take Section 179 on uh, new roofs, HVAC, fire alarm, and security systems. Assets that would otherwise have been depreciated over 39 years, now you can write off fully in year one, provided that you have the, the income. It doesn't take you into a loss position. All these depreciation changes are positive for taxpayers. This change to certain applicable partnership interests commonly referred to as carried interest, 
is, is negative. It tries to put a longer hold period on uh, kind of profits only interest in partnerships so that you don't get long-term capital gain on assets that you sell uh, after one year. The, the hold period is now three years. This is targeted at um, hedge funds and real estate developers. Again, little nuance in the code that has to be resolved is it's not clear actually, even though they intended it to apply to real estate, it's actually not clear whether it does or not because of the specific type of gain that you generate on the sale. So another area where we need some, some additional guidance. Uh, for mostly startup businesses, there's, there's a compensation change that allows uh, companies that grant uh, restricted stock or non-qualified options to employees. Uh, the employees can now defer the tax on those options and RSUs when they vest up to five years, provided that you meet all of the uh, requirements as uh, a qualifying company, as a qualifying employee. Uh, there is an example here that you can review in your own time, but essentially the employees can push off tax for five years. Uh, a qualified employee is somebody who owns less than 1% of the company is not a current or former CEO, is not related to a current or former CEO, and is not one of the four highest compensated employees. To be an eligible corporation, it's private companies, no public stock, and you have to have a written plan uh, to grant 80% or more of employees options or RSU under the same terms. Now I'm going to turn it over to Li Ting to talk about some of the international tax provisions. Thank you, Brendan. So, um my colleagues have been talking about tax cuts and how it impacts corporate and um, individuals as well as flow through. Um, in order to pay for all those tax cuts, there need to be some revenue need to be raised to pay for them. So um, at the end of the day, we're looking at about $325 billion being collected due to changes in the international tax provisions. So the impact to U.S. taxpayers based on these changes are um, U.S. is switching to a hybrid territorial system to kind of mimic other developed countries. Under the 2017 tax structure, any earnings um, earned by foreign, U.S. owned foreign corporations are not taxed in the U.S. until repatriation. That's why you have heard about Apple, Google, Starbucks, you know, keeping the funds outside the U.S. and not repatriate back to the U.S. until there's a repatriation holiday. So now under the tax reform, the IRS is going to um, incentivize all these companies to bring approximately $3.1 trillion of, tax, of earnings that have not been repatriated back to the U.S. So in order to switch to the hyper-territorial system, the IRS enacted two additional code sections. There's a participation exemption and transition tax. I will go over um, in high level what these, um, how these impact foreign, uh, U.S. owned foreign entities. And another impact uh, of the tax reform is it would reduce the incentives for companies to keep their money offshore and hopefully drive U.S. economy and bring up the stock market, which we've seen kind of drop in the past few days. Um, it will also help keep intangible property within the U.S. instead of companies setting up um, companies in Ireland or Cayman Islands to keep their IP. It also imposes a minimum tax on routine offshore earnings that incentivize you from um, keeping your money offshore. Before I kind of go in detail of some of the tax reform changes, I'm interested to know how many um, of you out there are currently utilizing an interest charge domestic international sales corporation or also known as IC disc within your current business. For those of you who don't know what an IC disc is, is it is an entity that is set up to effectively convert your ordinary income into a qualified dividend income, it's a 
this incentive is available to manufacturers, producers, resellers, and exporters of goods that are ultimately used outside the United States. Architects and engineers would qualify for IC disc as well, assuming they're working on projects that are located outside the U.S. So as I mentioned, you know, the IC disc structure converts income from ordinary income for individual effective 1-1-2018 37% to qualify dividend rate at 20% if you add um, the net investment income tax, the max rate you'll be taxed on, a quali on an IC disc income is 23.8%. Originally under the Senate bill, there was provision in there to repeal the IC disc effective 1 1 2018. So good news for 7% of you that is utilizing IC disc, that the disc was retained under the final reconciled bill. So, and here's kind of a slide um, with additional information on a disc. I do want to point out there is a typo on this slide. Um, disc dividend is taxed at a max rate of 23.8%, not 43.8%. So I apologize for that error. So please fix it in the slide that you're, um, if you print out a copy. Um, one provision that was included in the tax reform was sale of U.S. partnership interest by a non-resident alien. We've seen a lot of non-resident individuals investing in U.S. partnerships and getting K-1s um, via the U.S. LLCs. Back in 1991, there was revenue ruling where the IRS says if a non-resident person sells their interest in a U.S. partnership or an entity that files a partnership income tax return, the proceeds from that sale will be considered effectively U.S. connected income. That just means that it's U.S. source income subject to U.S. taxation. Well, there was a case last year, the Gratian Mining case, the tax court ignored that revenue ruling and said that the foreign person proceeds from sale of U.S. partnership interest is considered sale of personal property and it's not subject to U.S. taxation. So generally, when a US per, non-U.S. person sells personal property, that income is sourced to where, they're, where they live or the country of residency it's not subject to U.S. taxation. So in the in the tax court case, tax court kind of follows that ruling since, well, it's a sale of a personal property interest. So they're not going to tax that company on sale of U.S. partnership interest. Well, in order to fix that, Congress codified that revenue ruling into a new code section, A64C, and goes back and says, in case of a sale of a partnership interest by a non-resident owner, the LLC um, must kind of look to the underlying asset of the LLC to determine how that proceed should be taxed. So for sale after November 26, 2017, that is kind of how you need to be treating the sale of a non-resident interest in a U.S. partnership. Also added in the tax reform bill was um, withholding requirement. Under current requirement, when a non-resident sells piece of property in the U.S., there's what we call a FERPDA withholding. The buyer is required to withhold 15% of the proceeds um, on purchase of piece of property from a non-resident alien. Well, under Section 1446 withholding, now the buyer of this LLC interest is required to withhold that 10% withholding tax from the seller. And that 10% withholding tax must be remitted to the IRS. And um, if the buyer fails to do so, it falls on the partnership to collect that withholding tax from the buyer, since the buyer is a member or partner of the entity, it makes it really easy for the partnership to um, collect that and remit that to the IRS. So, so under this new tax reform, sale of 
partnership interest by non-resident alien now kind of mimic FERPA withholding, except it's at a lower rate of 10 percent, as well as 15 percent for sales of U.S. real estate. Participation exemption. So as I mentioned briefly, in order to switch U.S. to a hybrid territorial tax, tax system, the IRS had to reenact a couple of additional new code sections. Um, one of which is participation exemption, just high level, it essentially dividends that comes back to the U.S. won't be taxed in the U.S. again. Under 2017 tax law, when funds are repatriated, it's taxed in the U.S., and then it goes out to the shareholders of these corporations. Well, under the new rules, any dividend comes back is not taxed again, but that means whatever foreign taxes you paid on that dividend repatriation wouldn't be eligible for foreign tax credit. And this participation exemption only um, applicable to C corporations. So if you have an S corporation that owns a control foreign corporation, which essentially is a foreign corporation that you own 100% of you wouldn't be eligible for this 100% dividend received deduction. In order to make sure that 3.1 trillion that's currently offshore and has never been taxed in the United States, the IRS imposed, is imposing a one-time tax, what we're calling a transition tax or deemed repatriation tax, that will need to be paid um, with filing of your 2017 income tax return. It basically looks at all the foreign corporations' earnings outside the U.S. that have not been repatriated back to the U.S. Congress definitely didn't make, did not make this easy for us because there's two EMP measurement dates. EMP is essentially an untaxed earning. Um, there are two measurement dates, November 2nd and December 31st. Well, I... At this point, I'm pretty sure, you know, none of you closed your year on November 2nd. So if your company's growing, likely we can just use the December 31st as the measurement day for the one-time repatriation tax. Once um, you kind of determine that earning amount, it would be taxed at a reduced rate of about 15.5% about for cash and its equivalent and 8% for um, non-cash equivalent assets on your books. These reduced rates are for corporations, for individuals that own foreign corporations. We're waiting for guidance from the IRS on how um, the reduced rate should be computed since the individual's highest tax rate is at 37%. Um, if we just need more guidance to see what that, there will be a repatriation holiday as well for individuals, but it won't be the 15.5% with 8% for corporate. This item, Form Bank Account Reporting, FinCEN 114, or also known as FBAR, it did not change under the tax reform, but with a lot more of you and companies going outside the U.S., I thought it was important to cover this to make sure we are all in compliance with foreign disclosures. If you are um, a signer or an owner of a foreign bank account, financial account, or even a Bitcoin account that's located in Cayman Islands, you potentially have an FR filing requirement. You would be required to file if at any point of time during the calendar year, the aggregate balance of your accounts is $10,000 or more. And this is not just for owners of these accounts. If you are a CEO, CFO, controller of a um, company, and you have signatory authority or the ability to wire funds out of the, the account, you have a reporting requirement as well. FBAR is due April 15th. This year, it's due April 17th. It goes in line with the tax return due date. It can be extended until October 15th, but there's no extension. Um, U.S. Treasury just assumes that if you don't file it by April 17th, you're extending it. So um, it's an automatic extension. The FBAR does not get filed with your income tax return. Your income tax return goes to the IRS. The FBAR goes to the U.S. Treasury um, Financial Division. 
but it does get prepared at the same time with your tax return. And there's for an individual, there's actually a question on whether or not you file um, FBAR, with, you're filing FBAR with the U.S. Treasury. So when in doubt, you know, file if you know you have a foreign bank account, but you don't know what the balance is, check the unknown box and file it. Don't just ignore it that I don't know the balance and not file. Because the penalty is $10,000 per form per year. And if you know you have a foreign bank account that you have not been reporting, if you have additional questions, let me know, um, email me or call me. There are voluntary disclosure programs we can help you um, go into that will hopefully minimize the tax. And then that kind of covers my section. Um, I will turn over to Brendan. Here's our standard caveat that we have to put on the slide. Um, we're going to get into some Q&A now. We're going to address questions submitted by our attendees. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do so using the question box in your webinar control panel. If we don't get to your question today or if you have additional questions that come up uh, as you're thinking about this stuff afterwards, please reach out and contact us. We want to be a resource for you. Our contact information is at the end of the presentation in our slides. So on to the questions. First one, what are CPE credits? It's uh, Continuing professional education for CPAs, something we have to do uh, every every three years and make sure that we're staying current with uh, the new laws. Uh, question for Chris, is there some type of formula to determine if you should have an S or a C corporation? <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It, it, it's, a, it's a facts and circumstances based analysis based on the amount of income you have, the amount of salary that, that you pay, the amount of salary paid to non-owners, the uh, state tax, state taxes. Um, it's, there's no one size fits all answer, unfortunately, and it would require a careful analysis of both. Um, in a lot of cases, existing S corporations, um, it's probably gonna make sense to stay that way, but again, um, there probably isn't a one size fits all answer to that. Next question, does the 80% carry forward limit related to net operating losses apply to carry forwards that are already in effect or just losses beginning in 2018? No, this 80% limitation does not apply to NOL net operating losses that were incurred prior to this change. So there will have to be a tracking of NOLs incurred prior to 2018 and after 2018 and they'll have to be treated differently for tax purposes. Another question we got, if you do a tax-free exchange of stock, does the gain tax exclusion follow it? I assume we're talking about a section 1202 gain exclusion. Does that track with the new stock if you do a tax-free exchange? The answer is generally yes. I think the last question we have time for here today, LLCs didn't seem to be covered. Is that because an LLC can be a partnership or a corporation? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, there was there was one other question about um, uh, scroll back up, please. Uh, is there any guidance on whether uh, uh, foreign partners of a U.S. partnership would be eligible for the twenty percent pass through deduction? Um, if the foreign partner is filing a U.S. income tax return, um, a ten forty, and are very likely, hopefully, they're filing that they would qualify for the 20% pass-through deduction. Um, it, for this foreign partner's foreign income, it would be taxed as a graduated rate since that income is considered U.S. source and effectively connected U.S. income. So yeah, they would qualify for it. Great, if we didn't get to your question today, we will follow up with you individually. Um, we appreciate you joining us on today's webinar. We hope you found it valuable and informative. There's gonna be a brief survey uh, at the conclusion of the webinar. We appreciate your feedback, and as a reminder, the survey is required if you want that CPE. Uh, a recording of today's webinar is gonna be made available on the resources page of our website, www.bpcpa.com. And we wanna thank you again for joining us, and hope you have a great day.